Waking Up From Work podcast. My name is Dave Swillam. Let's get ready to hustle. Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome back to the Waking Up From Work podcast. You're listening to episode 52 today. This is your host, Dave Swillam. I do kind of kick this off in the live recording of the podcast that we did, so sorry for any redundancy in that, but uh, I did want to give you just a quick brief on what we're up to today. So if you've been following along in order, the past two episodes have been about switching up the game in the obviously current state of craziness with COVID in the economy. So the past couple episodes have been very strategic and very forward on actions and ideas and stories of how to combat the current situation and some action to take right now. So I wanted to kind of do the exact opposite with this episode, shut down the news, shut down some you know websites and Facebook chatter, and get back to the why behind why some of us do the creative that we do. Just take a chill pill, go outside, go hang out, get some exercise, listen to this and think about why is it that you should put up with all the shit that you need to, to fight your way through the hard times right now? Why are you doing the thing that you care about? So this episode's super chill. Look back and reminisce and talk with someone who's been on the podcast before, my friend Simon. We talk about how we got into music to start with. And that really led to the why behind why I am an audio engineer, and he is working screen printing shirts for bands and musicians around the country. So we just talked about how we got into music, the story of how we kind of came to be the people we are in that way, and went into different things like influences, different towns and vibes, tour life, etc. Things like that. So that's today's episode. Super, super chill. Hopefully this uh, helps take your mind off stuff. And I really want you to think today, why do you do the thing that you do and is it worth it? All right, let's go. Welcome back to the Waking Up From Work podcast. You're listening to episode 52 tonight. I'm pretty sure this is like kind of impromptu. It should be 52. I'll edit that out and post if I'm completely an idiot. But uh, welcome back to the podcast If uh, you have been listening all along, you're actually going to notice that we've got a familiar face on. I feel like this might be one of the first times I've had someone back on, Simon. So you're you got to be a pretty cool, pretty cool dude, I guess. Yeah, I think you've mentioned me several times. Every time I I listen, I get a shout out here and there, and I'm like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, I have friends. Yes, hell yeah, dude. We talk all the time. So people that haven't haven't listened to Simon's episode, go back and check out, I think it's episode 19 on our podcast. It was the first time that he jumped on with us. Yeah. Episode 19, Using Art to Overcome Our Roadblocks and Breakthrough in the Music Industry with Simon Pellet. That's a great episode if you want to focus on how music can be a tool for you to work on your own mindset. It's done a lot for Simon, and we we touched on quite a bit in his episode then. I wanted mm-hmm. to get Simon back on because some time has passed, you know, another 30 episodes. And in that time, you know, Simon and I really never broke our our hangouts. Like, we've been chatting. He does great work with the Skinny Armadillo print shop out in Dallas-Fort Worth area and printed up some shirts for my small business and and uh, also some shirts for the podcast as well. He has been chatting with me, obviously about podcast stuff, about music stuff, and uh, we just formed an awesome relationship just off of that digitally entirely, dude. And yeah, um, totally. I I wanted to have you back on because I I think that we've both grown uh, both podcast wise and people wise, and uh, I want to just touch back in with you, man. So yeah. thanks for being on. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for uh, having me. And Heck obviously, yeah. uh, you know, I my my podcast um, that particular episode was episode fourteen, I believe. Um, and I think this one is actually going to be number forty five. 
So okay, right on. Yeah, yeah so, so we've both been incrementally adding to our numbers. But yeah, congratulations for reaching fifty. I know you said you didn't want to celebrate it, but I think even even in times right now when everything's kind of dark, you got to celebrate the wins. So I agree. I think so. I I was saying that. I, I do plan on celebrating it like a total buffoon. Like I, I legit think Ryan and I will put on like suits and drink champagne, like just be ridiculous. But, uh, I just didn't want to at that time. Cause that's when stuff like was really under the gun on the move and still obviously is. And yeah. I, I had information or things and thoughts in my heads that, that, that I was like, I need to get this out now before that. But I think I'll still have a silly episode come out at some point to, to kind of do hoorah. But you sped along quick, man. Forty five. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you pumped him out, man. You really yeah. I, chugging I, along. I had to get into a rhythm. I was struggling to, you know, organize interviews and then edit them, and then and then I don't know the 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 end of last year. I just cranked them out. I think I did six in December. Nice. Um, I knocked up the numbers. I'm catching you up. So yeah, you're I'm gonna s- pass me. I'm you're stuck at home, so I've got like three next week already scheduled. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> You're taking me out, man. Yeah. So if, for those of you that didn't hear that episode, I don't think I, I think I totally missed it in your, your intro in on this one, dude, go check out music on your own terms podcast. That's Simon's podcast where he talks to a lot of artists and people in the music business as mm-hmm. well. So there's a lot of shared ground with the people that have been listening to this show with his audience. I think you'll like it. Go on over there. Check him out. Check out our uh, shared episode. So Simon, you kind of came up with the topic when we were jiving a little bit earlier today. Do you want to tell right. people what we we want to break into tonight? Yeah, so I mean, we didn't really touch on it on our last episode because we were focused on that one topic. Um, but I kind of wanted to riff on um, you know, how we both got into music and podcasting maybe. Um, cuz that's that's kind of what I focus on in the beginning of my episodes. I interview the musician or the business person. And I, I really find out what got them into what they're doing. Right. Um, so, you know, lead us off. How'd you get into drums? What, what was your, what was the impetus of getting you into music and say, I have to do that. Right. Well, there's definitely like different, uh, stages of it because part of it was so young. So I remember like, I went through the very traditional way of like third grade, you have the ability to do band, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember going to this school during the summertime before the school season had started between second and third grade where they had like uh, in each different room, they had an instrument that you could try. Like you, I tried like a trumpet and like a sax and then the drums and I tried everything. And after that happened, they didn't even have the cool shit. They had Mm -hmm. a drum pad and they had a glockenspiel. We all know that nothing's sexier than a glockenspiel. But uh, I played that and, and uh, I, I was feeling it. I, I think my attention span and, and my aggressiveness was was driven to that. And uh, so I picked that up and went through like normal band, like every year doing symphonic band, mm-hmm. normal as you can be. High school hit and then marching band was there. And uh, I did get into that and started doing like the marching, uh, the marching drums. And then I think it was sophomore year where I actually picked up my first drum set. And that kind of changed up where I was going from there. Because from then on, before that point, I never really was playing rock music. I wasn't playing anything except for like this classical stuff that would be assigned really. Sure. And then at that point, that's where I started you know, my first hardcore band is a sophomore in high school and we started playing for anyone in New Hampshire. I think that you probably didn't know it cause you were around at that time, dude. Uh, Rocco's, do you ever, did you ever go to that club? Whereabouts is that? Uh, Manchester. Oh, is that, oh, is that just that? Like sh- if it's still there, that little shitty. Pub? Oh, absolutely. The I biggest think I know shithole. what you're talking about. Yeah. It's- I never, I never went into it, but. So, dude, yeah, it is yeah, the I shittiest know. place in the planet, but they threw the best metal shows ever. Like, I have not seen local metal shows that hot since that time period has come and gone in this state. It was right. amazing. Like, you, I've never seen 
them be able to take 200 kids to go see a local metal band on like a Friday or Saturday night and pack a dirty, scummy Manchester pub. It was Mm -hmm. unbelievable. So we were playing there when we were like 15, 16 years old, having these uh, 40-year-old drunk dudes try to fight us. And uh, (laughs) that kind of kicked it off for me, man. I don't know if you want me to go on more, if you want to tell like how you got in, but that's, I can. that's I mean, really what, my entrance in. I just want to know, you know, what, what music, like what, it, it, was there a specific drama that you aspired to be at that stage? Or was there like a specific, you know, album that really, you know, got to you said, oh man, I just have to do what he's doing or she's doing. And when I was in the seventh grade, I was on the bus and I think at that point, I was definitely into like Blink-182 and Green Day and all the, the 90s alt stuff. I was already in the mm-hmm. door on that before I even had my kit. And then in the seventh grade, there was this kid that sat next to me on the bus who gave me Slipknot's self-titled CD. Mm-hmm. That put me into Slipknot right away. I right away got into that like really hot and heavy and uh, wanted to be Joey Jordison so bad. And uh, mm-hmm. he was an idol for me. A lot of the reason why I got into double bass skills as early as I did was because that guy was a s- unbelievable double bass player, double kick. Tiffany just said instrument petting zoo. <laughs> instrument petting zoo. <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's literally exactly what it That's was. Funny. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, so I'm I'm a fair bit older than you, so cast your mind back. Okay. The darkness of the early nineties. Um, That's so yeah. Still, I mean, our, I like our, the darkness of the early nineties, yeah. dude. Our, our um high school system or skill system in in general, it def- definitely had the in school lessons, but it it wasn't as organized. There's no marching band or anything. But yeah, no. I mean, I oh, I'll tell a story in in middle in the equivalent of middle school. I was going to go learn cello for one one lesson. Because you grew up in the UK. I grew up in the UK. So right. we're, we're talking the south of England. Middle school. Um, yeah. So I went for a cello lesson with a group. And the teacher said, okay, so I, wanna, I want you to sing these notes on the piano. So she plays the piano. I'm like, I got a sore throat. I had so much anxiety over performing or, or speaking that yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going back. So that, that ended that. Um, but and that's then, the equivalent of middle school. That's the equivalent of middle school. So we're a little earlier. So high school is 11 to 16. So there's five years of high school. Okay. So I got into high school and I really did start to want to learn guitar. I mean, my parents always, every, everyone in the planet had, you know, queen greatest hits. Um, and then I started getting into, I, I saw like, uh, Brian Adams, one of his videos and I saw his, um, you know, his guitar player had a red Stratocaster and long hair, and I thought, well, oh, that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure where exactly these two things lined up, but my parents' friend came over and gave me some acoustic lessons. And then in high school, we had somebody, or we actually, no, we went to a, a, like a demo of all these, you know, area musicians that were s- teaching at schools. And so the guitar teacher said, y- you kind of, you kind of seem like um, you'd be better off in, in doing rock and not doing the formal stuff. So he, he started teaching me privately. What um, do you think? Like, is there anything that he said why he felt that way? Was there anything that happened that, that led him to that belief? Or he's just... Probably because I said I wanted to play uh, like rock music and Joe Satriani. And uh, he's like, well, you're not going to be playing that in school. You're going to be doing like green sleeves and stuff like that. So right. he's like, <laughs> yeah. he was like, you're, you're going to be better off learning what you want rather than what is dictated by the program. Um, right. And yeah, so like my, uh, my dad brought a Joe Satriani mixtape home from um, some, one of his colleagues. And I, and I, you know, played that thing to death. Um I had a neighbor that brought me over the black album and countdown to extinction. And that got me hooked on metal, you know? So yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it was all kind of a massive influences uh, at the same time. And then, you know, my, uh, my guitar teacher, Ian Barnett, you know, I, I was with him for at least three and a half years all throughout uh, most of high school. Um, I'd actually really like to get him on my podcast too. Cause he's still, 
He's still a kick-ass uh, teacher in the community uh, back in England. Cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that was the beginning. And then I never practiced my scales because I was boneheaded. And I wish I did at the time. He kept telling me, learn your scales and never did. Um, but yeah, it was just it was just all the... I, I don't remember an, um, a specific thing that drove me. It was always like, I just want to do that. You know, and, and that was... That was basically it, and I've been hooked ever since. I've been, you know, aspiring to to be, you know, the dream theater of the world or whatever, and yeah, getting all these guitars. But yeah, that's that's where it came from. And music itself has just been. I I could I couldn't imagine life without music. Same, dude. It's just just have to have it. Yeah, I. I would imagine that any creative for a creative fulfills the same feeling that I get. I just Mm. can't picture it any other way because it's been so integrated into my entire life since I, I can actually have memories. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess like second grade, I lived like an okay portion of life without music, but that's there's so little memory in that time for me that I literally don't have a perspective to know what what else there even is like that that literally oh, is such sure. an integrated piece and um I don't know I don't know I'm sure that you have the same things but like there are things that it's like also bad that it's that integrated too because like I was telling uh, uh my wife the other day when we were doing yoga together right mm-hmm that that yoga class had this preset Spotify playlist and it was a very like it wasn't an aggressive yoga class that was meant for like uh, a workout it was a very like it was very mind focused like let's get you present it was almost like meditation sure i couldn't get that experience because there were some songs that had lyrics and i immediately yep. like a- any song anyway like obviously like anything like if there's rhythm to it like i'm thinking about it like you're always kind of thinking anyway, it's going to initiate that. But like, if you can get more ambient or slower or anything, I can, I can sort of get away from it and try to try to get away. But immediately, like same thing for when I'm running, if there are lyrics, I'm focusing. I'm also reacting Uh on those. uh, I'm reacting to it. Like a thing for running is, is tempo runs for training for this marathon that I'm trying to train up for. They, they want you to do these tempo runs. And, uh, I can lock into a tempo so that can be a a useful tool for me, but also I also really kind of need the, the music that I, I really get into to be able to give me that energy. I can't just like spontaneously pick all types of music that are just at that tempo. And with those, that music, I have to actually choose along this long run. Say I'm doing a 12 mile run for the day. I need to strategically choose where does that music go to control how I am reacting. So I'm not running incorrectly. Like if I'm doing a long, long run, sometimes I might have to start out with some Bob Marley or I need to start out with some, uh, I don't know, like some post Malone or something like that. Something that's chill and I can start off and I'm not going to blow all my steam right at the gate and I can kind of, okay, get into it. Don't, don't give everything. Cause you have to be at this for a while at the end mm. when I feel like total shit and I have to complete like another three miles, then all of a sudden, like really like all of it's coming out, Acacia strain, Slipknot, Devil Wears Prada, you know, um, I don't know, great American yeah, I, ghost, some I, I, nice thrashy I, stuff to just make me so pissed and swear yeah. probably out loud past my headphones and feel bad for the neighborhood, you know? But uh, it affects me, man. It it totally sure. is pure control, which can benefit me or actually like screw with me a lot. Yeah, I I had a similar experience when I was running five k's ten years ago. I did the uh, Signa five k in Manch a few times, Sick. and I did that with like I don't know. I probably did a, a Lamb of God playlist, and I had them had all the tempos, you know, charted in the charted. line. Oh, oh yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah, dude. I did I did overexert myself. Like I pushed it too much and I couldn't, you know. There was did a you, bit where did I was you like, run no, in, I'm gonna have to walk now. Did you run in <laughs> but, triplets if you were listening to Lamb of God? 
Uh, yeah, it was pretty severe, but yeah, but yeah, totally. Oh my god! So I don't remember if I asked you this or not. Did you ever go on any like small tours or anything when you were out? No, I never. I've never toured. So my the last band I played in in New Hampshire was called Angry Octopus. Yeah. Um. I mean, we 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 opened for Tantric the fir- my first gig. Oh yeah. Um, that was we, at the Jewel. We, that was at Jewel. Yeah. And then we we won a battle of the bands. And we went on radio, so we were doing well. You know, there was a bit usual disagreement, and uh, we were we were going to actually uh, open for um, Lynch Mob at Jewel again. Okay, and so uh, that was we didn't end up playing that, unfortunately. But um, I still went to the gig, you know, and I I actually uh, hooked up with the first episode I ever interviewed a band was Testa, episode two was Tesla. And- <clears throat> The band called Testa, T E S T E R. So they're in episode two of my podcast. Great, great set of guys. And I was almost, I saw them live at that gig and I'm like, I'm almost glad we didn't play because they, they had such energy on stage. It was so awesome. But that kind of started to talk to people from, uh, you know, the ones that I'd met while playing in that band was kind of the, the start of, uh, you know, doing this podcast in the first place. So, hold on a second. So, what started the podcast in that instance, in that way? A lot of, I, so if we back up a couple of years, I started learning about entrepreneurship. You know, my friend Alan, who's in episode 10, was giving me recommendations for books and, and all, all this other stuff. Tony Robbins was obviously the number one. Um, I say obviously, but he's. He's the man. He he's the man. I mean, he's not everyone's cup of tea, but the the stuff he puts out is really I, really useful. But I love him. You can you can go you know any direction from there. All spider webs. Um, and so I I was learning a lot of uh, social media strategies, and which none of it makes sense now because we're you know several years on and it's all changed. Yeah. But you know, I just kept hearing, oh, you can't make make money because of streaming. You can't do this. Can't do that. And it's like. Well, let's switch that around and say, how can I? And that that one sentence is why I started the podcast, because I wanted to give the entrepreneurial mindset um, out to the musician community that don't really, they, they, they you know, they, they have the, the kind of mindset of you ha- you, you're all that's necessary is your art and you don't have to worry about the business. Right. If you make good music, everything should fall in your lap. And that's just not true. And that's not true of any business. You know, you, you have to work on the business side of things. And I wanted to get that mindset out to people. I should link you up with, uh, we just had James from the Better Band Bureau podcast on to talk about business for bands not too long ago. And your podcasts awesome. yeah. are like so intense. Like his, his is different where he has two different, um, you know, two different people from two different bands as, as co-hosts and they all talk about business like when you're in the band treating the band like a business the logistics and everything of it whereas yours is very like mindset and practice focused but absolutely i'll I'll link you guys up because like i just thought about that now and how 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 in the same in the same boat you are yeah that's awesome but uh that's one thing i've tried to think about for me like just to pick up on where i was at before I had my first band, right? We were playing at clubs when we were really young, playing these hardcore shows that were yep. really big hardcore shows. We'd be opening or something, so the crowd wouldn't be there in full force yet. But like we were, we had the opportunity to play for a good crowd, and then watch these people that were amazing metal bands uh, in New Hampshire. And uh, that band broke up. I went from being the the drummer doing some choruses in that band. And the next band after that was hardcore as well, but I ended up being the front man for that because right. we couldn't find a front man, but we could find a drummer and I just wanted to get playing music again. So sure. that was fun because it kind of changed the dynamic for me a lot in where I could be at in music because I went from being behind a drum set, which was like just having that drum set, like you're just naturally positioned behind the band. And even if you're like the craziest stage presence ever, 
even if you start mm-hmm. singing to bring the spotlight over, like you're just never the thing that has to, like everyone doesn't always pay attention to the drummer. I went from being sure. in that kind of like safe space to being the front man with no instrument, like straight up, I have a mic and I have to perform. That's what I have to do. And right. that flipped the script for me because I had to get out of my shell at that point. And that really pushed the extrovert out of me quicker than anything because i had to literally everyone looks at you and they're like okay what are you gonna do at every show and uh with that band you know we played to the last couple years of high school went into college and uh moved about an hour and a half away but on the weekends we were still really active and uh that was a band that i actually got the opportunity to tour with um nice once i think it was like a Mm -hmm. a week-long tour around new england and uh everything that could go wrong on that tour went wrong everything like to give people perspective like i wrote a song about it with my current band because it's just funny the very first day of tour was the fourth of july i got seven stitches in my head before the rest of the dates of the tour had even started at 2 a.m so Fourth of July in the hospital, getting seven stitches in my head on the first tour of my life. Probably at that point, I was maybe 20. You know, Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, tour, you know. uh, But that experience really was like nothing else that I've ever had. And I haven't even been on a ton of other tours past that. Like I I did with this other punk band that I was in uh, in college at the same time. And with that band, we ended up opening with a punk band up for Wiz Khalifa. How's that? Okay. <laughs> hey, whatever we, works. We won some Battle of the Bands, and the winner of the Battle of the Bands got to w- open up for whatever that Spring Fling artist was. The Spring Fling mm-hmm. artist happened to be Wiz Khalifa, and we happened to be a punk band that won the Battle of the Bands. And so we got on this sick, huge stage outside in front of like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drunk bros and we thought they were gonna like throw tomatoes like old school style at us but uh they were just drunk enough that they actually had a really good time cool but uh i don't know man like it definitely wasn't a luxurious life but even like a week-long tour was like an experience that was like nothing i ever had to wake up in a different city every single day and meet different people and also amazing people in the music community every Mm -hmm. day a different place and different people was like such like as an extrovert that energized the shit out of me i was so pumped up like every day even if i was just eating peanut butter and like three days out from a shower you know or longer right for sure yeah it doesn't Touring, other than seeing new places, doesn't really appeal to me. Honestly, I'm more of a, I'm more comfortable playing in my own studio. I do, I have found that. I've played on, you know, reasonable size stages. I've even fronted a band down here, Creatures and Chemicals. One show, it was. I yeah. don't have the shirt on tonight, but I rep it a lot. No, you don't. You do rep it a lot. Yeah. yeah. No, I. I mean, <laughs> uh, again, it was. We needed a singer, and I'm like, I'll just do it for now. And I just, I found that I wasn't happy with how I was playing bass. Um, I just wasn't uh, concentrating enough on it. And, you know, my voice isn't really cut out for singing anyway. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, over the last year, I've, I'm, I'm naturally an introvert. Obviously, my, we, we talked about mental health in the last episode. Yeah. And that's, you know, what my podcast covers as well. So, you know, I've always had this uh, kind of problem with, you know, expressing myself in front of people and and getting over that fear. Yeah, so it's, it's I kind of prefer to sit at home and play and record and and have that be, you know, my output. Yeah. So, and I think you know the the podcast format works really well for that too. But it's really gotten me out of my comfort zone in actually talking to people, and I've been really fortunate to to make uh, you know, some really good friends along the way and interview people that I really keep in touch with. So yeah, dude, it's, it's been a great, great experience. So we just talked to um, Mark, Mitri, uh, Mark Metry 
who is an author of a book called Screw Being Shy, and he runs the mm-hmm. podcast called Humans 2.0 on episode 49 of this podcast. We talked a lot about, you know, introvert, extrovert, and the way that basically, you know, shyness is not a bad thing unless it gets in your way. So it's right. like if you're doing the things that energize you and the things that mean the most and make the most progress for you in a way that works for you. And then it doesn't matter if you, if you're, if your greatest joy is, is being in studio and that's how that fulfillment comes from you, then that's perfect. You know what I mean? Right. For sure. Yeah. Sure. I get like very different, uh, fulfillment from, from playing live versus studio where playing live doesn't feel as creative to me as it does like an adrenaline hit it's like an adrenaline junkie thing like i you know even when i'm playing very frequently i start feeling it less but like right now like even playing like an open mic i feel it i still feel it i don't know why i've played like a ton of shows in my life but i still feel it where i get nervous and i get that uh adrenaline boost and when i'm done with the show i have like a real big high of it for the rest of the night so like when i play shows it's almost like a a short term like adrenaline fix like like going snowboarding would be or like that like that type of thing for me where it's something that's very about getting that experience for me but it doesn't feel creative because now i'm performing things that i've already written and i've played many times so it's not a creative fulfillment but studio sure. is a creative fulfillment for me and that's what drew me as an audio engineer because I get to just bathe in that creative like every mm-hmm. single day. If I'm working with people, I'm watching them figure their shit out and change the way that they're going to write their song. And I watch the flip happen and it just blows my mind. Like to follow their trail energizes mm-hmm. my creative, even if I didn't even make a decision because I'm watching, why did you pick that pedal? And I see, okay, that's how it fits the song. And like, mm-hmm. why did you? why did you choose this thing? And I see that's okay. That's putting this vibe into it. So studio is, is the creative fulfillment for me when I record with my band, it's the same way because I'm not, I'm not doing the thing I've rehearsed a million times. Oh, I guess I am. I'm, I am doing the thing I rehearsed a million times maybe, but once you're in studio, your, your options of how you're going to actually portray that song are now unlimited. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And you to create that is a completely different thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I love, um, being able to just like lay down tracks and tracks of guitar and just, you know, mess around when you were just saying that I just remembered back when I was, I don't know, eight, seven, I had a, um, a cassette player, you know, as you do as a kid, yeah. and I would, I would actually sit there and record fake radio shows and just goof around whatever cartoons I was watching at the time and just make up stories. So I'm like, I hadn't thought about that for a really long time. And, you know, maybe I was destined to be a podcaster, <laughs> even <laughs> at a young age. You're already creating a radio show. Yeah. This is really what it is, man. Podcast is literally just modern day radio, but everyone sure. actually gets to have their own say in it. Yeah, for sure. Right on. Which is, it's, it's a great, it's a great platform and it's, you know, I love the collaboration with different shows and different, um, you know, interviewers and, and, and everything. It's, it's such a healthy, just a, a healthy, uh, community. You know, it's, it's what I, I think mu- music can, depending on your locality, you know, it, some, some areas can be very devoid of the community aspect some of them can be very good yes it just depends where you are yeah you know it's it's definitely you can see it when you play different shows in different cities Mm. for different nights sure you know you can see uh if you play a show i mean boston i'm lucky man you were in new england forever i don't i think we talked a little bit about texas but Mm. Some of the local scenes here are are incredible. Boston's amazing. Uh, Portland, Burlington are amazing. New Hampshire is okay. New Hampshire like had some awesome things that have gone away, and it has some things that are coming back, but it can be weird still. Right. You know, depends. 
Yeah, I mean, I cities are different. I mean, down here, I'm not so sure on the Dallas scene. I haven't really experienced that. I mean, there does seem to be a decent scene down here, but I haven't really played any live shows in a while, so um, I'm really not that experienced on the live aspect of it. There's there's definitely a ton of young bands here, it, you know, at least in, in my, the genres that I listen to. Yep. I'm not much of a country uh, fan, so Same. I know there's I know there's a ton of country artists in you know the further south you go. I so, can't. I can do um, like old school style country, but I can't do like country pop. It's not my style, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it. You know, it's, it's whatever you're into, really. I, I there there may be quite a decent um, you know, hip hop electronic scene down here. Um, I do see. Just just based on the 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 way people post in the forums, yeah, country is obviously popular. There d- does seem to be a decent hip hop kind of style, and a lot of punk. Oh hell yeah, that's you cool. Know, so there's and there's some heavier stuff, but I mean, generally speaking, you know, I I tend to go to death metal shows, progressive shows. That's what I I I like, you know. And and every time I go see a show, there's always a local opener. And uh, they're always really good. Now, because I think we, we uh, you know, we talk music a lot. I, we obviously mm. both, like, we have some things that, like, line up with our own tastes. We have some things that are totally different tastes. You know what I mean? Sure. What, uh, like, do you like any of the modern music right now that are not even, not to say modern, because, like, you can like newer prog bands or newer, like, bands in the genres that you like. Do you like any of the contemporary written pop or rap or anything that's happening right now are you out at you know mixed genre shows or would you say that you're you're in uh certain like fields like where where are you at with like i feel like i'm getting hit with different influences and i can feel it change me a lot over time sure i mean yeah my music i mean i can i can speak to my musical uh you know change through the years um i don't i don't tend you know, I've 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 suffered from some health issues over the last year, so I haven't really been going to a lot of shows. Yeah. Um. So when I do, it's like the the most important show I want to see. Right. So it's been death metal or you know like something Paul you've Gilbert wanted to see forever. Rock. It's something you exactly. Really I haven't really done a lot. Um. But you know, my musical taste over the years, I started out listening to you know stupid stuff on the radio, pop. Uh. There was a com you know comedy. Uh tracks that came out for comic relief and things like that when i was young yeah rick astley you know i got rick rolled at a young age yeah. I had two cassettes <laughs> um <laughs> and then you know the stuff that my parents would play they had queen and they had tears for fears i'm a huge tears for fears fan you know and i listened to that and then i started getting into rock and then i started getting into metal and guitar and yep um, but yeah there's other stuff that i listen to like i'm a huge huge osric tentacles fan which are it's like synth meets rock, but it's it's you know it it's like an old school jam band on synthesizers. Cool. It's just a complete acid trip. But they are, I mean, there's they're a huge underground band. And you know, when when I was in my mid teens, I started getting into more technical bands. Uh, Dream Theater being the the you know probably the biggest one at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I like everything from blues, Texas rock all the way to extreme death metal and noise. And I, I really like elect some electronic stuff. Yeah. You know, one, one of the resurgence I really like is this eighties, uh, synth wave, you know, uh, movement that's been coming There's out so much uh, throwback know, like to eighties right now. I love Carp- it. Carpenter Brut would be my, my favorite of that genre. They're a French band that, that have come out in the last couple of years. Their stuff is excellent. Cool. And like I said, I don't necessarily like country per se, but there's a bunch of guitar players that I really like, and and I see my taste changing. You know, I listened to a, an album by Andy Wood, who happened to be the uh, touring guitar player for Rascal Flatts, and I went and saw him and met him. Um, and he's a banjo or ukulele player, yeah, or something like that. But he he transitioned to guitar, and he's just an like an incredible player. And I find myself going more country because of players like that right so yeah i mean it's whatever moves me i don't i i don't particularly like the formulated pop for you know four four timing that's 
it's just uninteresting to me. I like stuff that's pushing the envelope and, you know, and if, if that means that it's a huge bass drop in the middle of a death metal track, that's, you know, an electronic four beats to the bar or whatever it is. And, and it's just something completely different that you're not expecting. Yeah. That's the stuff I really like. The more stuff going on, the better I, I, I go to towards it. Right on dude. Yeah. It's crazy to hear the way that like, you might not have even done that on purpose, but even the way that you explained the elements that, that create that want for you mm. kind of says a lot about the way that you, you think I would say, you know, the things that you're focusing in on. And, and, and I think that that's probably coming from me where like, I've talked to you a lot and I know kind sure. of the way that you, you have certain things that you, uh, you know, you focus on right. And personality wise. And, uh, but, but you have a total mix of things that you like, but it's just the way that you talked about the way that why, what makes me follow into these different pieces of music. Hmm. And that's just interesting. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just been interesting to watch, uh, that transition happen because, you know, I started off in, on alt rock and, and punk, and then obviously like symphonic and, and marching. And that always stayed like a split thing for me. Like I ended up going to, to college for, for audio and we had to declare an instrument. So I declared percussion and I kept in like percussion ensembles, marching bands, symphonic and so i've i've always been doing like classic uh you know music in in classic rock and and these things and then i always had that punk and that hardcore and these like total total different things in that time and all that time i always rejected hip hop always always mm -hmm. just like not even like a little bit hard stop nothing i only do rock or i do like this classic music or so i just didn't even I ignored all of it. And then it didn't really happen till I like really like the last three or four years of, of like really focusing on like, not me just as an audio person, as an audio engineer, but how do I be a producer? How do I be someone that, right. that produces music? And I think for me, I had to do a real inward look and change the way I thought about it, where it doesn't matter what music I like because I'm producing so many different styles of music. And the only way that I could get good at producing was to be all in on that music. And the only way to be in all in on that music was to really enjoy that music. Taking a project on that I just don't like is not good for anyone because I'm not, I'm not engaged with it. And so I've been mixing hip hop and Christian rock and indie pop and uh definitely symphonic and rock and like things that are more in, that used to be more in my domain and by mixing into those projects that i initially might not have liked i didn't want to let my client down i also didn't want to not enjoy what i was doing in something that i love so i found ways to flip my mindset and i didn't think of it even in i didn't think of it anymore as a genre i didn't think of it anymore as I don't know anything more than what it was as a song and where is my listener's attention going throughout the song? What are we doing as elements mm. to, to change freshness out, to change the way that someone's psychology works? What's the message of the song? How am I supposed to feel during this? When I listen to this, where am I at? What's happening there? Is it a party? Am I by myself on a walk? Like really getting way into like, what is this supposed to do for someone in life? And how are we doing that? Ever since that happened, I've been just sitting in out of any genre. Like I, I totally yeah. now broke all that, you know, bias that I had in the past away. And I listen to so much different stuff right now. I did in the past, but now I'm really, you know, enjoying, enjoying some top 40 stuff enjoying so, tons of hip-hop tons of uh you know all the stuff that i liked before like jazz and classic and old rock new rock hardcore punk like i'm all over the place man because it, it just it went from being a genre or styles or even timbral instruments that i enjoyed to now it's like i'm just focused like you were saying i'm just focused on that song what am i doing to create energy and excitement mm -hmm. and emotion is really important right. to me too. 
and I can focus that- even on just the way that they chose their lyrics to follow that away. Even if the song is real, real slow, that means a lot to me. And that mm-hmm. that's, I don't know. I think that's helped me develop. Yeah. I mean that, that basically points to the, you know, I think, I think that kind of points to a transcendence of a musician from, you know, just, just the beats, just the sound of the guitars to, what is the emotion behind yes. it? Yes. Like, what is the person, or what are you as an artist trying to get across? You know, and I think that that is what music is. It's, you know, it's 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 a universal language that portrays somebody's emotion. So, you know, I I I think I shed the um, you know genre specific mindset uh, fairly early on. I was always you know, going against the grain in high school because I was the only metal head to a right. certain point. Everyone was like, oh, you know, Guns N' Roses are great. And, and I was the only one that kind of liked Metallica. But and they're all batting the on you. So was, you got to go all in and be like, F yeah, this. But th- then this, this like, other guy was like showing me this uh, drawing of the Megadeth logo. I'm like, oh, then, right on, man. You know, and everyone was like, like my own band were ragging on me because I used too much distortion. And I'm like, that's <laughs> what I want to play, dude. Yeah. And that, they were all into Oasis. And, and you know, the, the time period was like Oasis and Blur. And, and I, to this day, cannot listen to Blur. Uh, Oasis, sorry. Blur is not too bad. But yeah. Oasis, I've never, I've never liked. Just, you know. Yeah. It, people have their thing. But that's, that's, that they were like the, the popular thing back then in the day. And I'm cranking, you know, Carcass and, you know, and entombed and at the gates and everyone's looking at me funny. I'm like, You're like, I guess I'm going all in on this hey, then. That's, that's what I'm, I'm into. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's had uh, a good effect, man. It's like, even in uh production, it's like, and in business, it's just like, whatever gets it done is the way to mm-hmm. do it in my head now. Whereas before I used to let stupid, uh, stupid reasons be, a, a judgmental bias or some reason why I would block myself from making moves. Whereas now it's like, if it's going to do the best thing for your business and be, you know, a, a good thing, an ethical choice for other people, then do it. Like if it's like, if people are like, Oh, don't use that, you know, don't over distort that guitar. Well, distorted guitars didn't exist until someone was like, I, I forget the story. People are going to slaughter me for this as an audio engineer, but who was it? It was like a, he actually like poked holes through the cones of yes, the cab I, to make distortion. I want to say it was the Trugs and, you know, a, a headstock may have gone through a speaker cone and then they di- they figured they out that it. it made this. Yeah. It was either that or someone just wanted to make the amp louder and they, some, it, it came from a rip speaker. You're absolutely right. And then, and then they were doing know, it on purpose. involved with the circuits and, you know, Clipping the uh, clipping the signal and probably orange amps and Marshall amps were kind of doing stuff at that time and yeah and and now we have Uber distorted amps that sound so sick amazing yeah <laughs> so good but but you can't you can't make new things unless you're breaking the rules or unless like mm-hmm. you know if you do. Like I tell people this who are learning audio engineering or learning podcasting and they're like back to your mindset focus when they're scared to to act on something because it's not the thing you're supposed to do or you're not supposed to start the podcast that way or you're not supposed to do your interview on Apple headphones instead of a microphone. You're supposed to have the SM7B, you know, it's like, dude, it's like whatever works to get it done is the answer for Mm -hmm. it. And whatever helps Mine's- you create and allows you to create with fluidity. Yeah, for nothing sure. else I mean, matters mine, past mine's that. Man. Like, what, whatever's whatever I can afford at the time. You know, like I, I told you before we came on, I you know I've been running my uh, recorder off a a homemade uh, little wall warp plug. Yeah, and, and that wasn't working, so I got an ISO brick, and you know everything's a lot cleaner now. And you know, look around the room if people are watching on video, I've. I haven't had time to actually treat this room. This is my uh, new office slash. This is the closet in the in the converted bedroom, you know. And I've got blankets on the walls with. And 3M. you have a zebra blanket, you know. 
Say what? You have like a zebra blanket on the right there. That's on your left. Oh yeah, it's more of a more of a kind of you know. I, I'd say it's like a sixty-year-old. Um, That's legit, dude. You know, sixty-year-old velour tracksuit from a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for for what what's the word? Uh, um, uh, a woman. Uh, I'm having a brain. A woman's fart. tracksuit. Uh, oh, a know, jumper. Yeah, um, a jumper. A jumper, yeah, but I'm talking about like a woman who's always going after uh, younger men. Oh, a cougar? Cougar, thank you. Yeah, it looks like a, a, a cougar's... <laughs> but anyway, the point being is that I put these blankets up because the sound, the, the room sounded like shit, and I haven't had time to make some actual panels. Yeah. So, whatever works. And I got a blanket on the floor soaking up that echo, and I'm getting it done. Wow. That's awesome. I totally had another thing to say, but immediately when you said cougar, like you derailed my whole head. Like I, <laughs> I joke about cougars all the time and make fun of them. So, or make fun of people and, and cougar and cubs, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm derailed. Texas has a, a, a uh, disturbing amount of teams of kids, sports teams called the Cougars. Really? So, oh yeah. Really? The Cougars cubs right on J- just Cougars in general. <laughs> like, yeah, that's an interesting choice given the uh, social, you know, the social meaning of that word. Wow. All right. Well, so. I think I'm juiced out, dude. Yeah. You have anything? It's been a great talk, but yeah, it's getting a bit hot. That's the one thing in this room I don't have is is airflow. Oh, really? So my 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 interviews get hotter and hotter. In the studio that I work out of, have obviously like AC and heating. But in our sessions, the vents are so loud. When it's mm-hmm. summertime, I shut AC off, man. And it yep. it roasts in there. It like think about like a band, like a typical four or five piece band. Mm-hmm. No AC on, and then like maybe you're tracking drums and then whatever for hours. It roasts. It's like unreal. But I don't know. It's kind of part of the it's part of the journey you, you kind of like you're like sweating like crazy it's like hour four of you doing vocals and you're it's like 100 degrees and it just kind of that gets the art out of yeah. me i don't know i mean we could go down a technical rabbit hole and get really nerdy but you'd think that these studios would have isolated uh, power coils for all those motors i don't you know considering know. considering how much elect mag- electromagnetic equipment is in there and the the there's just no that that shouldn't ha- really happen. It's like forced, yeah. It's forced AC, mm. and it's fine in the control room. It's just the live room. There is a vent, and I don't know. I don't know the way that we, however it's set up. I've never been able to actually make it so that I can run a long day session. It's fine for like four hour mm. sessions. It's not bad, but long right. day sessions we start frying. But mm-hmm. right on. All right. Cool deal, man. Do you this was this was fun. Do you ask uh questions at the end of your podcast? I do. And I it? I took I kind of sort of took the lead from you a little bit, but mine mine uh basically what significant negative experience you overcame or have you overcome and what did it teach you? So I don't know if that's yeah, what I mean, was there was there a big negative thing that, that really affected you that you kind of learnt from in music let's do it in music in anything you can do it in music as that's the topic or you can do it in anything let's do it with music to trip me up one that was really really impactful and i might have mentioned it on the podcast so far was in college so i spent all that time as a percussionist and then like as that vocalist for the hardcore band up in high school right in symphonic band in high school I don't know. I think I just had to be the cool guy that was on the snare drum, which is kind of a sad statement anyway, right? The sad, like I had to be the cool guy to have this, the snare drum the whole time. And everyone's like, that's not cool anyway. So you might as well. But right. long story short, I just ignored melodic instruments. I was like, I'm not playing the friggin' xylophone, I'm not playing marimba, I'm not playing glocks. Like, Every time they would assign me it, I would just find some way out and I'd be kind of a dick about it. Like I just wouldn't Mm. do that. I would play snare drum and bass drum and whatever I could, you know what I mean? I just wouldn't do it. When I went into college, 
and started doing music theory and sight reading and all these things, I started getting my ass kicked bad. And people didn't give a shit because they're all music Mm -hmm. majors. They're all doing whatever. I was getting my ass kicked. And then the teachers really initially hated me for being a percussionist because they had seen that time and time again where they'd come in. They somehow got into the program because they practiced the shit out of the marimba part they had to do to audition and then went in and got their ass kicked, right? Well, when I was at the very end of my theory, we had this teacher that was like a little Italian dude and he, I will never forget him. He he was a effing monster in music, first of all, like God bless him, super mentor to me now. But there was this moment where I had to do a sight singing test. You go in at like 7 a.m., you get the first note on the piano, and then you need to sing a piece just by reading the music and just know intervallically what that should be based off of the first note. And I was bad at that. My ear wasn't wasn't firm. You know right. what I mean? I had just hadn't put the time in. Mm-hmm. And I remember singing it, and you had to sing it in a room with him by himself with you, and it was always just really nerve-wracking for me anyway, and I sucked. And I sang it, and he did. he looked at me, didn't say anything after I was done. Like normally there's like a, he starts telling you things that were good and bad. Nothing. Quiet. Dead silent for like 30 seconds straight. No, nothing. Just eye contact. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, holy shit, like say something. And he said to me, he's like, do you think that there's any other programs that you could do here at college other than music? And I'm like, Mm. what? And he's like, do you think that you want to do any other thing but this instead of doing what you're doing right now because you're not taking this seriously being here and you're not capable? And that dude, mm-hmm. I left there. I skipped like I think the rest of the classes that day and I was just like mind fucked. Like I felt terrible. I felt it, I drew into exactly what he said. I was like, I guess I don't think I can do this. That was probably the single biggest like mental like issue that i have with myself in music saying like i don't know if i can be a musician all in after this just happened and i just took that later that night i think i ended up staying up practicing like to the point where all of my fingers like had like blood blisters like in in there till late 2 or 3 a.m getting up for a test early in the morning for music theory and studying the shit out of it And, uh, I basically, since then I went in and I went after it. And, uh, ever since then, whenever I've had like a piece assigned in in, in any way, uh, I don't mess around at all when I'm preparing for it. And that was, that was big. That, that helped me so much. I I owe a lot to that man. He helped a lot. That's awesome. How about back at you? Uh, same question. I mean, for music, uh, in the recent years, I um I got forced on stage at like a a backyard birthday party. You know, um there's a little bar off off of 101 that people do open mics. I can't remember what it's called. What town? And someone was throwing Say again. What town? I I don't remember honestly, but it's like exit 2 or 3 off of 101. It's just a small little bar in a neighborhood. 2 or 3. So that's gonna be I, that's it, gonna be Salem it, it or Wyndham. Yeah, something like okay. that. Um but it doesn't really matter. It's so I, I you familiar with the the band Darth? Darth? Or Chim Darth, D A A T H or Chimera? Nah. No. Uh so so they they were a, uh, both kind of death metal bands. Um but the the guitar player, his name was Amor or is Amor Wurstler. He's an He's a PRS artist and he's an incredible guitar player. So he 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 was doing cl- a clinic at the local PRS dealership. Oh, sick! And um, you know he 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 went to this uh, you know this party that the uh, owner his blues band was playing, and the owner was like, "You should come up and jam." You know, I'm like, I haven't played on stage in in like a decade. Yeah, I'm super nervous, and so he got me on stage finally. And I could barely, I barely knew how, to, I was so, everyone was drunk, no one cared, but I was so nervous that I couldn't even do a one, three, five chord progression. Right. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then, you know, the solo I took was probably three notes bent 
a few times and that was about it. Yeah. Um, but I got to jam with Amo Wesla, so that was pretty Which cool. Which is awesome. But I'm like, at that point, it was obvious that I needed to work on my, you know, my confidence. And I I was spending so long just playing and playing and playing and never right, getting out. Shortly after, I joined a, uh, a, a Black Sabbath cover band on bass. And we never played live, but I got to play with other musicians for a good year and a oh, half. Yeah. And then, and then I joined the other band and, you know, then I started playing live again. That's awesome. So that's, that's, yeah. I mean, in music is probably one of the worst <laughs> things. No, you know, just absolutely freezing on stage and, you know, not, oh, not even being able to remember how to dude, play. Dude, it feels terrible. Just like that adrenaline stuff that I was talking about earlier, fucking up on a, on a show, like unreal feels like you are naked in like middle school or something like that. Like it feels just awful. It feels like just the worst thing ever. Even when people don't even know that you're doing anything wrong, they literally have no idea. They're like, yeah, you're killing it. And you're like, you feel that way though. You just feel like they know, you know? Right. For sure. Um, So, okay. So we'll wrap this up, but what are some, cause I asked you this on episode 19, do you have any updated resources that you'd want to share? Like, is there anything in that time that you're like, people should check out this book or video or podcast or anything like that. My number one music business book is still Ari Herstand's book, which just came out uh, the second edition recently. I'll endorse that too. That's how to make it in the new yeah, music I mean, industry, it's, right? It, yeah. It's, it's such a killer. Book. killer. I mean, the, just the basics and all the, all the, the staples like start with why, one minute manager and and all all the classics just have have some really good stuff in them. Any any time you you search for a mindset book, you know you you just need to hit Tony Robbins and then go from there. I like that. It- oh, I you know one book that was really helpful for mental health was uh, uh, Mark Maron. Do you like his podcast? Which podcast? He's a so Mark Maron WTF What the Fuck podcast. Oh, he's fucking huge, dude. Yeah, he, that's probably the. I think that's the most popular podcast. That's out. one Maybe of Joe them. Rogan's or something, yeah. but Tim Ferriss. But no, uh, he he released a book which was a compilation of uh, guests he's had talking about different mental health topics within their yeah. life, and it you know it just brought home the 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 brevity. Uh, sorry, not the brevity, but the the magnitude of how serious mental health is for people that think they're normal, quote unquote to just people who know, you know, they're very mindful of what, what's going on in their yeah. head, but there's just so many different experiences in that book and from different angles and different, you know, family issues and drugs you know, and, and whatever. You know what it's called? Suicide. Um, it's the, the WTF Mark Maron podcast book. I don't, I, I don't remember the exact title, okay. but I'll if, find you, it. if you just Google Mark Maron WTF, um, it's just a, is I I think if nothing else, it gave me a lot of empathy for other people, even more than I already had. Because I've talked about that before a ton. Just so important. You know, the more you suffer, the more I I believe the more you suffer, the more empathy you get from yeah. people. Um, but this this actually, in addition to that, I found v- very comforting in in just the the perspective of. Hey, I'm not alone. I, you know, other people who are famous are going through the same shit. So right. That 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 to me was a really good book. Cool, awesome. So uh, for those of you out there that are in your car or whatever, uh, just head on over to wakingupfromwork.com/slash/shownotes, and we will have that book in the show notes if you do want to check out what Simon was was recommending. So last, Simon, if people don't want to go back to episode 19 and check out. Where do people stay up to date with you if they haven't checked out those links before? Music on your own terms.com. Cool. Same for uh, actually the Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash music on your own terms. Uh, my Instagram handle is metal doggy, M E T A L D O G G I E. Um, and that's pretty much, yeah, where you'll find me. Uh, building the YouTube page, haven't really got a huge handle on that Same. just yet. Um, I'm so weak on that's YouTube. coming. Yeah, I've got a I've got a Patreon account that I I've just started uploading content to. Um so that but that's all linked on my website. So if you just go to the website, you can find everything else. Nice. 
Right on. And then the uh, the other thing I wanted to plug real Please. quick is, uh, you know, obviously uh, stuff going on in the world and being, you know, being music related. My co- the company I work for, Skinny Armadillo, um, does work for a lot of different uh, artists around the country. And obviously everyone's been shelved. You know, tours are canceled, which, you know, you, you, you think about the artists and they're not touring, but. Uh, you know, we, we work with some bigger bands, so they have a staff, they have crew, you know, and those guys don't work on royalties. They, they work on, they work on getting the paid for the gig. Yeah. They've got, they've got no, like the, the, at least the artists have residual income coming from, you know, what little streaming does give you, but they've got their royalties, hopefully if they've set up right and they've got other stuff kind of keeping them afloat, but the crew. Um, so what we've done is set up a, you know, set up a t-shirt that we print. You can buy the t-shirt and you can, when you buy the t-shirt, $10 will go to the artist of your choice. So you just need to say what band or artist or crew of said artist you want it to go to. And, and Skinny Armadillo is going to donate $10 per shirt sold for, for the music community in, in, at large. Wow. So that's so. like anyone who makes a shirt through Skinny, Skinny Armadillo. No, so it's a specific shirt. So we've got a web store set up um, to do that shirt. To do that shirt, that's awesome, um, dude. Uh, we'll have to link it in the because uh, it's just been set up. We'll have we'll to link, link it up. in the show. Yeah, notes. we'll link it. Send it. Send it over um, to me. But yeah, so it's a it's a shirt that supports music right now. Um, so you can choose your colors. You can choose whether you want a black print or a white print. Um, but as I said, yeah, choose which band anywhere you know you want the uh the donation to go to and that's where it will that's go. awesome yeah simon will send that to me guys and we'll have that in the show notes and i'm also about to make some broad wing my indie rock band tank tops hopefully through skinny Arm- armadillo damn i can't talk either bro yeah skinny armadillo mm-hmm. and uh and see if we can pump any money into uh you know these small businesses and these bands that that need our help guys so awesome well, Simon, thanks for being back on the Waking Up From Work podcast. That's the first time that that's happened as a, as a return guest. Awesome. I'm special. You're special, man. All right, guys. I hope that helped take your mind off of the craziness out there, got you centered on your why for going through some hard times right now and making it through the other side as a stronger creative And if you want to catch up on any of the show notes, head on over to wakingupfromwork.com slash show notes. I'm going to be starting to work on a lot more content, doing live mixing and things like that to stream out on Facebook. If you're interested in the audio side, head on over to crawlspaceaudio.com. That's my website for recording if you want to check that out. If you want to check us out live, head on over to Instagram at Dave Wake Up. Every single Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, we are live when we are recording the episode with our, me and Ryan or with our guests. And you can hang out with us, ask questions, chat in on it. It's been a really fun time. You know, Last episode, we had, I think, 50 of you awesome people out there hanging out with us. And it's been really cool to hang out while we're all indoors here. So have a killer week. Next week, we're going to be talking to Ryan Sullivan, a.k.a. Sully Bop, a.k.a. Bopcast host. So he's a rapper, podcaster, DJ, and does a bunch of marketing and things like that as well. Kind of like a, a mix-up arts and business type of guy. So we clicked really well, and it was a good time. So can't wait to share that next week. Pumped up for you guys this week. Cheers.